Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. My name is Josh Davis. And I'm Tommy Shane. And if you'd like to be a part of the discussion during our live taping, you can check us out at youtube.com slash user slash cur of anarchy on Mondays at 9, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific. And you can see the final product on the air at youtube.com slash user slash voluntary virtues on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And if you have any comments during our live taping, uh, please let us know through Facebook and uh, the thread that I've started. Uh, yeah, just let us know. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so that's about it. Yeah, Thomas, we have another guest. Yeah, tonight we're uh, joined by a good friend of mine, Kika Houston. Is it who? Do you prefer Houston or is it Houston? I still don't know how it's pronounced. It's uh, it's Houston, like Houston, uh, Houston okay. Texas. Yeah. Okay, cool. How you doing tonight, man? Good. Feel a little a little yeah. tired. I'm off work, so. Yeah. Hey, positive. that's always the best. Thanks for coming on, though, man. We appreciate it. We always enjoy a fresh perspective on this show. Not a problem, and, and this yeah. is this is going to be a perspective I'm happy to talk about. Okay, yeah, this is going to, uh, to our viewers, we got a good episode tonight. Uh, Currency of Anarchy first, a show about anarchy. We are going to be discussing anarchy, the basic principles of anarchy. Uh, so first of all, what is anarchy? What does it mean, and what does it entail? Uh, anarchy, or anarchism, is an anti-political philosophy that is centered around self-ownership, non-aggression, and voluntary association stems from the Greek word anarchia, meaning an absence of rulers. Uh, so although somebody researching this philosophy will undoubtedly uh, find a multitude of ideas and philosophies concerning various socioeconomic systems, anarchism in and of itself is not concerned with such ideas. Its only regard is for a free society devoid of the dominion of unwanted and involuntary authority. I can't stress that enough because if you voluntarily um, submit to an authority that is not a contradiction of anarchism because that's not being ruled. Uh, perhaps the most important principle of anarchism, in my, in my opinion this is the most important principle of anarchism, is something known as self-ownership or sovereignty of the individual, uh, meaning that you own yourself, you and only you have the right to dictate your own life and your behavior so long as you don't harm others or their property in the process. Uh, this is one reason anarchists despise most systems of government, because they involve one human being trying to take ownership of another. Uh, in America, for example, if you vote for a government representative who will undoubtedly attempt to create laws dictating the lives of others, you're infringing upon their right to self-ownership. To support government in any form wherein subservience is not voluntary is to support the enslavement of another the enslavement of the individual and his or her own freedom by the collective or greater good. This brings me to my next point and another basic facet of the anarchist philosophy, uh, something known as the non-aggression principle. This entails that one human being shall not initiate force or aggression on another. Uh, this is not to be confused with passivism. Uh, the non-aggression does not prohibit the use of reactionary or defensive force just the initiation of force. Uh, this means that in an anarchist society you have every right to defend yourself and your property from the initiation of force or aggression by others. This rings true in a status society as well for the most part until it involves the initiation of force by government, uh, in example cops using threats of force or aggression or the initiation of force or aggression against a sovereign individual uh, for being in violation of some arbitrary government policy or edict. Excuse me. Uh, an example of this is when a police officer stops someone and discovers that they're currently in possession of a legal substance. Uh, now even though this person has harmed no one but themselves in using this substance, agents of law enforcement still reserve the right to essentially kidnap this person, uh, throw them into a cage, Eventually, they will stand before a judge. They'll be ex they'll be sentenced and extorted into paying some uh, arbitrary amount of money, despite the fact that the government agents doing the extorting were harmed in no way, shape, or form by the actions of the defendant. Uh, this is violence in and of itself. This is structural violence. Considering that kidnapping, imprisonment, and extortion are all backed by violence. Uh, 
However, should this person choose to resist his or her own kidnapping and extortion, they will most likely be assaulted by law enforcement agents, kidnapped again, and charged with further crimes, or even murdered, all for the sake of enforcing some arbitrary government policy. So, the basic idea of anarchism is that you exist without rulers, or uh, in other words, you own yourself. You rule yourself. You and only you own yourself, and you and only you have the right to dictate your own behavior so long as you don't infringe upon the property of others. Uh, that's why property rights are a cornerstone of anarchism, recognizing that people own, that each individual is a sovereign individual and owns themselves and their own property, and you conduct yourself in however way you see fit so long as you're not infringing upon their property rights. Uh, that's why government, when it's involuntary, when your sub, when your subservience to it is involuntary, uh, is a is a complete violation of self ownership. Because to support government is to support the ownership of others. To support government aggression or the initiation of aggression or force on anyone for 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 any reason, is to assume ownership of another. And that is, uh, in my opinion, I'm, I don't I don't believe in objective morality, but I do hold my own subjective morality, and I believe that that is immoral and wrong to try to take ownership of another. If anything, it is by definition, the very definition, slavery. So, basically, anarchism is centered around the empowerment of the individual, the empowerment of the of the individual taking ownership of him or herself, him or him or her own his or her own property and his or her own actions uh, and behavior and uh, ultimately being responsible for your own actions and behavior uh, and there's a lot of misconception shrouded around anarchy that it is chaos and lawlessness and that's just not true it is rules without rulers there are still rules um, what I've just been talking about this entire time are, are essentially rules self the rule of self ownership the rule of the not you know the non-aggression principle um, so, yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about today is the, the basic facets and principles of, of uh, anarchism, how they apply to uh, the individual, how they apply to society, and how we can, um, you know, ultimately practice them in our day-to-day -day life. So, Josh or Kika, anybody, go ahead and say what you got to say. Well, I think that's the main reason why most people confuse, uh, and this maybe this is jumping a little bit far ahead uh, too soon in the the hangout, but it's, it, it's probably the main reason why people confuse anarchy with communism or try and jump over to anarcho-communism, because of the uh, the incentive to keep enslaving people with arbitrary laws and money and etc. Um, and and that and that pushes them even more towards embracing a communistic lifestyle where everything is equal under under their under the guise of providing for all and the redistribution of wealth. Uh, but right. I believe they, most they things, don't, communism comes at the same price. Yeah. I mean, they there's don't. always a potential for um, dictatorships and stuff like that, but with anarchism, there's a lot more uh, control by the individual, and and in, in certain cases, like when it, uh, an ANCAP or an, uh, anarcho-capitalism, there's a lot more power for the consumer. Well, yeah, with anarchism, you don't. no one has authority over you unless you give it to them which is one common misconception of anarchism, is that it is against, and I can't even say that this is a misconception, but this is a common belief that I disagree with, the non-hierarchical non -hierarchical, um, associations. Personally, I see nothing wrong or contradictory to anarchism to submit to a hierarchy, as in your, your job or whatever that may be. Because you're there voluntarily, you're there of your own volition. You're you're voluntarily submitting to this authority. That is not a contradiction of anarchism. That is not being ruled. Um, basically, um, yeah, that's you know there there's just a whole lot of misconception around anarchism, and it um, it just kind of it really muddies up the waters, and it makes it really hard for people to get into anarchism because, like you were saying uh, just yesterday, Kika, the more that you research it, the more contradictions you find, the more yeah. different stories, different ideas, different philosophies, and when it what it comes down to is anarchism to exist without rulers. Uh, some people might uh, some people might argue that uh, you know from the 
etymology standpoint that anarchy means without rulers. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar, if you, either of you have read the article that Michael Heiss wrote about basically you're not an anarchist because you live under government. No. Uh, therefore, you have rulers, so you're not an anarchist. I disagree, and the general consensus seems to be that an anarchist is someone who subscribes to the philosophy of anarchism, the, the advocacy of a stateless society, the advocacy of non-involuntary authority, that sort of thing. So, um, Josh, you had something to say? Um, yeah, when it comes to... Um, Anarchy is without rulers, but there are rules, like you were saying. And I think a lot of people don't know where the rules come from, and they come from private people. Like you were saying, you know, you have the ability to rule yourself. But um, how do businesses run right now? Well, there, there are rules, but in anarchism, they would be the ones creating them. And uh, those that would do business with them would have their own rules, you know, or their own wants, and you know, it's basically just market exchange. There is no upper tier or lower tier or whatever. There's just exchange. And there's transactions. That's it. You know, the the rules are there, put in place by the owners of the companies and the owners of the self. So I I think that's where a lot of people get confused because. They say, well, if there's no government, there's no rules. That's not true. We have rules in the market right now, and they would still exist. And I think people forget that, that's all, because I had a hard time coming to anarchism without that knowledge or that, without that logical step. You know, like I never processed it as a liberal, you know, um, and then... Uh, you know, that's that's how I started transitioning to liberty, you know, outright, you know, minarchism, anarchism. It, it, I needed that base. Where the, where is that the – where are the rules? Where are the rules for the road? You know, people would own the road, and uh, the owners of the road would create the rules for the road so that, you know, all of the consumers would be able to – work in tangent, you know, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think that's a kind of a big point, honestly. Yeah, it is. And that, um, so before we jump too far ahead, I mean, what, what you just said definitely pertains to self-ownership. But um, yeah. before we jump too far ahead, let's just, I want to touch upon, I want to really emphasize the self-ownership part of anarchism because in my opinion and probably in your guys' opinion, in most people's opinion, uh, that's what anarchism is centered around, the idea of self-ownership, the idea that you own yourself. So um, so to, to a lot of people might think, you know, even though it seems pretty self-explanatory, a lot of people might think, well, what does that really mean? Um, that means that you decide your own life, you decide your actions and your behavior, and you are ultimately responsible for those actions and behavior. Um, a lot of people, you know, cling to this fallacy that um, uh, government is responsible for our actions and our behavior, and government is responsible to for keeping us safe and uh, maintaining our society, the functioning of our society, and, and all this and that. And uh, what a lot of people don't, they I guess they just never because if you go up to anybody on the street. And you ask them, Kika, I don't know if you did your uh, survey yet or not, but um, if you go up to somebody on the street and ask them, do you believe that you own yourself? You know, oh, I, my guess would be that just about everyone is going to say yes. I mean, who's going to say At least 99 out of 100 most likely will. I mean, they'll, yeah. they'll grasp some basic concept of what self-ownership is in their mind and then, you know, attach a definition to themselves. And they'll, they'll get it, but, you know, there's that random one out of a hundred who will ask that question and need more definition themselves. Exactly. But, I mean, basically, they, most people are going to say, yes, I believe that I own myself. I am my own, I am my own keeper. You know, I possess my body, obviously. I am in possession of my own body. Uh, but what, what a lot of people f seem to just fumble with is the putting two and two together, that if you believe that you own yourself, 
uh, you don't submit to involuntary authority. You don't submit to involuntary government because to submit to involuntary government uh, is to give up your right to self-ownership. It is to claim that someone else owns you, that either the government owns you or society owns you, uh, and they are able to dictate what you do and don't do, uh, what you what you put into your body, how you how you uh, commit business transactions with people, you know. Um, who you pay taxes to, um, what you know, all that sort of thing. What what you do with your own children, what you do with your own body, the whole shebang uh, is giving up your own right to self ownership. And why I say, why I s continuously say, uh, involuntary government. Uh, it might seem minarchist to some people, but I do believe that uh, voluntary government can exist. Uh, and it won't be a contradiction of anarchy because if you're voluntarily cooperating with an institution of, you know, uh, say a direct democracy, a, de a direct democracy, like say like a, a community government, you could you could uh, participate in that government. You could participate in the direct democracy. You could vote on things, but so long as you still had an opt out, so long as you still had a say you wouldn't necessarily be subservient to, not subservient, you wouldn't necessarily be, you wouldn't be a slave to that government. You wouldn't be a slave to that collective because if at any point they decided to do something that you didn't necessarily agree with, you could opt out. Therein lies the problem. When there's no opt out, when there's no say, uh, when it's not voluntary, when you are just, when you are just assumed under the authority of some overreaching government, you then become a slave to the government. You become a slave to the collective, and that is not self-ownership. So, yeah, anybody chime in anytime you want here. I'm just kind of rambling. And I think that's what, uh, in, in America, for instance, I think that's what the Republic used to be at its, at its highest point. There was a lot of, a lot more voluntary action than there is now, where it's mostly just democratic or um, more based on involuntary interaction with officials of the state. Yeah. Given, like, like we mentioned before, arbitrary laws and, and monies to pay for you know, breaching of those laws that continue to enslave us. Um, when it seems like the only way to, to free yourself from this kind of uh, ridiculous lifestyle is to advocate for anarchy. Yeah. And if, 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 the, if we have to deal with the misconception of anarchy being chaos for a while, at least we have the time to influence and enlighten other people to the actual definition of anarchy, which is without rule. Right. And just rule of ourselves. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And that's um, that's where the voluntary interaction comes in, too. When I start talking about vol voluntary government, voluntary subservience to, um, you know, a lot of... I know there's going to be some anarchists somewhere watching this going, oh my god, these guys aren't anarchists. They're talking about government. And it's, you know, there's nothing, technically all a government is, is a bunch of people getting together uh, and deciding on things and deciding to um, have this systematic um, means of operating. So we all, so if the three of us got together and decided that we are against the initiation of violence and force, we could form our own community, decide that that was wrong, and that that would be punished by os but you know by ostracizing that person. That would technically be a government, and there would technically be nothing wrong with that. Neither one of us would be giving up our self ownership, and neither one of us would be a slave to anyone else because we are doing so voluntarily and of our own accord and of our own volition. So. That's where the voluntary association comes in, and that's one thing that I strongly disagree with the anarchists who say that uh, hierarchy is anti, is that hierarchy is a, a contradiction of anarchism, and that um, capitalism is therefore a contradiction of anarchism because it is inherently hierarchical. Uh, but then they say, like, if you look on, up on Wikipedia what anarchism is, it says a political philosophy that is opposed to it, that is, uh, advocates a stateless society, excuse me, uh, and against hierarchical organization, but supports voluntary association. 
that in and of itself is a contradiction because if you're voluntarily if you voluntarily associate with a hierarchical system that is not a contradiction of anarchy i believe that the whole hierarchy thing is a is a misconception just more muddy more more mud in the water um, of people who are either you know i don't really know what their motives are and actually come to think of it i don't care to speculate on it i just know that it's not that is that has nothing to do with anarchism. It's voluntary association. Josh, yes. Um, I do want to bring up the point of jailing, and this is why jailing is actually probably totally against anarchism, because uh, you said that uh, people are free to associate, mm -hmm. and even if they were free to associate with those that are under board, you know the. People should be free to associate with others that are outlaws as well, um, even though that would be very stupid and probably uh, a death sentence, but <clears throat> uh, they should be free to do so. Now, I'm not talking so much about the outlaw himself. You know, he must, you know, be willing to pay. I, I'm, I'm really di diving in here into anarchism and the philosophy here, but... Um, this has been an ongoing debate on this show. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, th th um, this is one big reason. You know, you're taking away this person's life, and or more like time. You're taking away his life, um, and uh, that might be okay. But you're supposed to, uh, you know, f uh, uh, fulfill the injuries of the. Uh, victim's party, or the victim himself, or whatever, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, I'm diving in, but I, I wanted to clarify that, because freedom of association is a big deal. Anyway. Anyway. Well, I, feel like, I feel like if you were, if, if in the, under the concept of associating with, with outlaws, if you're going to associate with outlaws, there shouldn't be anything wrong with that. I think the divide comes when you begin committing the same acts that made this person an outlaw in the first place, like murder or theft, something like that, then you become, you know, guilty by association and thus become an outlaw yourself. So, I mean, there, there could be, there's obviously a certain divide, I think, there. Yeah, exactly. I don't think there should be any restriction until you cross that divide. And that, I think that would be pretty clear, but to some people, yeah. when, as soon as you start talking with this outlaw, you're You've committed a crime. You're randomly guilty by association for doing nothing. <laughs> right. Exactly. No, I fully support that. I, I fully support the, uh, support the freedom of association. And um, I always say that, you know, in a free society, if someone were, if someone committed an offense against someone or their property that didn't actually, you know, wasn't murder or rape or, or child molestation or some serial offense, uh, reparations would suffice. You know, you pay that person back, you know, for the property that you damaged and for their time that they spent replacing that property. Um, but if you're if you if you're a serial murderer, you're a serial rapist. I just believe that you should be ostracized because uh, if you have freedom of association, then we have freedom of association not to associate with you. It goes both ways. So um, also, you know, people would say, well. Um, it's uh, how do I word this? Basically, if you if you ostracize someone, you you di you you remove them from the property. You would say you're not allowed back within this area of property. People might say, well, how do you how do you own that property? How do you, how can you? What authority do you have to tell someone that they are not allowed on that property uh, or whatnot? My answer to would be to that. Well, you don't have the authority to tell someone they're not allowed back on that property unless it's your property. So say you're living in a community. <clears throat> say there's a known rapist who's around who's been ostracized who decides that uh, he doesn't have to listen to your, your you know, arbitrary authority on him, that he can come back whenever he wants. Well, businesses aren't going to let him in because that's their private property and that's their right not to let him into their private property. Homeowners are not going to let them in, him into their homes because that's their private property and their right to, you know, not include him in that 
exclude him from that private property. So basically all he would be able to do is walk up and down Main Street all day long, you know, and eventually someone would go out and, um, you know, someone would violate their non-aggression principle and basically initiate force or aggression on this man. And, you know, if he, if he had the, the uh, if he had the, um, what's the word I'm looking for, the resolve to withstand this aggression, uh, you know, day in and day out, you know, good for him. Basically, he would just become a human punching bag for people who hate rapists, who's pretty much everybody hates rapists, except maybe other rapists. And I'm sure even some rapists dislike rapists. Some cognitive dissonance going on there. But, you know, basically, um, it's just a way of s society would work that out in, you know, in its own way. You know, who, wa who wants to live and exist in a society where you are a black sheep, where no one wants to deal with you, no one will let you onto their property. No one will even engage you in conversation. Eventually, I like to believe that that person would just leave, and they would just become a memory, and they could go live, you know, like Kika said, they could associate with the other uh, murderers and rapists, and, you know, that you know could be their thing, and that's fine. That's what they do right now, though. They go to jails, and they're, you know, but they're allowed to stay alive, and that's kind of the whole thing. Like, it becomes a... A business model for jails and uh, those in the government, you know. So that's, you know, of course that's a statist model as it is right now, you know. Uh, but this is why I'm against jailing at the same time. So anyway, uh, we're probably agreeing here. I'm just saying. Uh, yeah. Well, you guys, you guys might disagree with me on this too, but I do support uh, the murder of rapists and child molesters. By other people, by other people who were not, so so say you know they weren't directly involved in the rape or the molestation. Uh, I believe that that in and of itself is justified because you are preventing further people from being victimized or violated. And some people might say that I'm a statist for saying that, and so be it. I believe that you know if you rape someone or you violate someone in that way. Uh, you cannot reasonably expect not to be aggressed upon by someone after the fact. It might not be it might not be me. It might not be you. But someone somewhere down the line is gonna they're gonna end you. They're gonna you know they're going to deal with this uh, situation. And I don't. Uh, I just have to say that I I support the nap in my own life uh, because it is in my own best interest and my preference not to initiate aggression and violence on other people because of the negativity that it makes me feel to to aggress on people in that way but I do not accept the nap as some all the some end-all be-all objective morality principle you know I just I accept it as an on an individual basis but it's, personally I would it's not care if, I would not care if someone initiated aggression or violence on someone who initiated that kind of aggression or violence on someone else, whether it be a rapist, molester, or serial killer? I, I know what you're talking about, Thomas, and I would, I would support it if the victim would call for it. And so, like, mm -hmm. if we, if we had, um, uh, you know, like arbiters and you know that whole system that's been laid out for anarchism or whatever, um, I can assume that there would be, uh, like, if uh, a rapist were called guilty by this arbiter or whatever, then I assume that the victim or the victim's family would want to, uh, you know, see remedy. And I think the only remedy for that kind of thing would be a death or something to that effect or, like, utter, like, millions of dollars paid out to the family, something like that. But that's... I think it's possible, and I think um, I think you're not far from the truth. I I just, in my own opinion, I couldn't see myself, you know, killing a life because life is, you know, the other hand of liberty. You know what I mean? It's like it, they go hand in hand. I I can't say yes, but I can I I understand it. Is what I'm saying. Well, I, I agree with what you say to an extent, but I also I I agree with what you say to the point where the vict if the victim calls for it right uh, 
but also, you know, and this might be based on, you know, this might be an emotional knee-jerk reactionary response that people might frown upon, but as, as a father of a two-year-old daughter, if something happened to my two-year-old daughter, my daughter is not capable of calling for the, the, the vengeance uh, or the, the um, you know, yeah, basically she's not capable of saying, I want revenge carried out on my attacker. So that's why I'm saying, you know, it might not be logically consistent with the NAP to um, carry out violence on a rapist or a child monster. But what I'm saying is I personally wouldn't have a problem with it, and I don't believe that that would be a contradiction of anarchism because, in my opinion, when you, vi when you violate someone, when you, when you rape someone, when you molest a child, uh, you're initiating, that, is, that in and of itself is an act of aggression on that person, if you initiate an act of aggression on that person, uh, you deserve basically to have aggression initiated upon you. You know, yeah. it might not be by that person; it might be by a third party. But you know, I wouldn't have a problem with that. And some people might say that's a contradiction of anarchism, and I disagree. And I, I honestly don't care. Yeah. Right. I think that I think the point has to be made too in this uh, in this part of the the conversation where uh, an eye for an eye or the golden rule has to be brought into question. Um, yeah. Maybe not in immediate self-defense, but in, in defense of um, other people who want to uphold their liberty as well. I mean, if, if, you, if you have a family member who's, you know, or yourself who's been aggressed against, and you want to prevent that from happening from somebody else, even if you weren't able to stop the initial aggression, there would have to be you know, some sort of reparation, whether this person who aggressed against you was either punished, um, jailed, I'll, I'll use that term, uh, labor, like hard labor or something like that. Or, um, you know, in, in, in the worst case, and I, I agree with both of you, I don't want capital punishment to be a thing, but if it's going to stop a murderer from continuously murdering people, I think it, it would have to be a necessity. Yeah. I See, my problem is I wouldn't even, I wouldn't use that term. That's all I'm saying. Uh, capital punishment is statist and it's, right, right. they're the that. ones carrying it out. Yeah, I'm just saying right. because uh, they, are, they get stuff. it wrong. They get it wrong all the time. And yeah. the thing is, if you talk about the victim and you want to remedy the victim, you know, that's that's when it usually comes, uh, you know, more correct. I mean, usually right. usually you find the victim and or you find the uh, perpetrator and it turns out for right. the best. There has to be like a balance between compassion and unfortunate punishment. There's, yeah. there's got to be a yeah. balance in everything. But yeah, 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 of course. This is something I was talking about with someone just um, yesterday about. Um, I support the death penalty for murderers, um, for serial killers, rapists, and child molesters. What I don't support, and this this might make people's head explode, I don't support state-imposed death penalty. Because the state kills innocent people all the time. Uh, so many people on death row are innocent and are sentenced to death anyway, and they're executed, and they don't... You know, I don't know if you guys have looked into that or if you've seen the movie Life of David Gale, but um, basically the, the state drops the ball and they execute innocent people all the time. So I am for executing murderers, rapists, and molesters so long as you can 100% prove without a reasonable doubt that they perpetrated that crime. So how you bring that about is completely beyond me. You know, I, I honestly, to be completely honest with you, I haven't put that much thought into it, and I don't consider myself to be that smart of a guy to figure out that system, how you figure out who who done it versus who didn't done it and who's just a victim of the system, you know. But I think by eliminating the system would be a good start, but then, you know, you can't ignore, like, the Salem witch trials and all that thing where, where people were just murdered, you know, based on just hearsay, you know. It has to be more than hearsay. It has to be more than circumstantial evidence. Uh, and it's just, the question is, you know, how do you get to that point? But, you yeah. know, I'm going off on a serious tangent here. Yeah, the, we don't have to get into this, but, you know, a lot of people have done a lot of work on this. Uh, Mises.org and... Yeah. Rothbard, I think it was, and all kinds of people. I mean, we can always do another episode on, on, you know, justice yeah. and, um, you know, crime and a free society. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, I guess it just all comes back to the voluntary association, if anything, voluntary action, voluntary interaction. Um, you know, you just don't associate with those people. You just ostracize those people through association. You, you don't associate with them. You get other people not to associate with them, and eventually they will just, you know, fade away, hopefully. Right. And, it, and it might be a bit advanced, uh, since this is sort of going over the basics of anarchism, but it might be appropriate at some point when we get past the Salem witch trials type scenario of anarchism um, into DROs, dispute resolution organizations. You know, and then right, arbitration right. organizations, yeah. yeah. Those would help. Those, there would be much better evidence collecting because there would be funded organizations that could round all the necessary info up to determine who was right and who was wrong. And, and you could yeah. have... We already people. have that kind of thing, too. Uh, we have private arbiters. We have uh, yeah. private investigators. Yeah. It's just usually pertaining to contracts. Right, right. Yeah, you have to somehow eliminate the conflict of interest. The, you right. have to eliminate the incentive to wrongly convict people for a profit. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, as I said before, getting rid of the state would do wonders for that because the state is uh, essentially in and of itself uh, a system of profit for, you know, wrongful convictions or for taking people who have cons who've committed some small, minute crime and, you know, turning it into this big thing. So, you know. And I watched uh, I watched a video uh, on YouTube about a dispute resolution uh, organization scenario in which a uh, a hypothetical man had committed a crime against a woman. It was like a mugging or something. And after all the evidence was collected and he was pronounced guilty, there was a decision on how to uh, how to punish this person. And one 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 point of view was that the the consumers who pay for these DROs. Um, Gave, uh, gave these DROs more bargaining power. So you have one DRO whose consumers are voting for uh, labor and the others can, uh, voting for like capital punishment. And, uh, and, and it would, it, I think a lot of the incentive, which is inherent in the state to um, keep people uh, in jail or enslaved and to enforce uh, crappy, crappy things like capital punishment, um, also probably flows through in a little bit of the same way in an anarchist based GRO and arbiter organization. Mm. There's a the whole voluntary aspect is how you would define the lines in, in those organizations. Hmm. I think that would be that would be a, a that would be a market more more of a market analysis than, than I have experience with. I, I find well, that interesting. The, the only way I th the only way I can see uh, these DROs existing is to support the victim and whatever the victim would want as opposed to what the whole, you know, as opposed to, like, uh, having a voting power type thing. Uh, right, right. Just, uh, I find that really interesting. you got to point me to that. That's really oh, yeah, interesting. I can, I can link you the video afterwards. Um, but it was... Yeah. It was Interesting because I'm not I'm not an economist uh, or hardly one if I can even give myself that kind of title. But it uh, it was it was fascinating how they described the consumer as an individual who, through his own comp his or her own comp uh, um, subscription to these DROs, um, gave them more or less buying power depending on how big that DRO was, and uh, depending on the pull that they had. Uh, on a monetary level, is how the punishment uh, transpired, and that, that I mean that would be. It sounds like an ideal situation, but at the same time, I could see many people arguing against it because there's yeah. an incentive involved to keep the DROs who are advocating for like capital punishment or jailing sentences. Um, it would keep them in power if if, if that's possible in a, in a more voluntary mm -hmm. society. That makes sense. Wow. Yeah, when I think about um, in incentive to create an anarchist society after a fall or you know a transition from a government or another society to, to anarchism, and and I, I've thought about this not as in depth, but I think it, to a bit of an extent where I understand it, but to an, an anarcho-capitalist society, um, it makes more sense from an individualist aspect because the individual has more monetary pulling power. Than say, 
you know, voting in a democracy, a democracy um, because their information can be easily squandered and misleading and you can just throw votes in all sorts of directions, especially when it comes to stuff that manipulates votes, votes like technology or the internet. Um, and if everybody's voting with their dollar, um, it makes uh, their vote more heard, I guess you could say. Exactly. Vote with your dollar. You don't vote at the fucking voting poll. Sorry, Josh. You don't vote at the voting polls. You don't vote... You know, you don't sign petitions. You vote with your dollar. You you support the things that you want to support, and you don't support the things that you don't want to support. Because, you know, like it or not, uh, in America, at least, and in most developing countries, everything is about money. So if you're not contributing money to something, it is not going to flourish. That's how you support that. It's funny to, you know, to hear, I, I don't have a stance on Walmart. There are things that I like about Walmart. There are things that I don't like about Walmart. It's funny to hear all the people bitch about Walmart that I guarantee you go and shop at Walmart. At yeah. least once a week, most likely. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, that's you know why why are you bitching and complaining about them and then you're you're supporting them with your dollar you know but yeah that's a that's a totally different tangent. Um, I would I would like to take the show. Uh, what do we got about 15 minutes left, Josh? 20. Yeah. Okay, you want to do the uh, the silver and gold thing, the currency prices, sure. and then I want to spend the rest of the show talking about the the nap. Sounds good. Yeah. So. Um uh, last time we did this show was uh, September 8th, and uh, today's prices come at 8.34 p.m. Eastern, uh, So, and today being September 15th. Silver last time was 19.04. Uh, it's dropped about 40 cents to 18.66. Gold uh, last time was 12.56.40. Uh, tonight it was 12.33.15. That's about a $19 drop. Um, and Bitcoin fell as well, uh, only about three dollars, four seventy-two seventeen last time, to four sixty-eight forty. Uh, so no big deal with Bitcoin again. Uh, so it's the middle of September. Uh, nothing really has changed all that much. Uh, so yeah, that's about it for uh, the currency. Okay, cool. So yeah, let's just let's just um, kind of spend the wait, rest of that. Wait till the holidays. Yeah, right. <laughs> Those prices are going to skyrocket. Yeah. Oh, you know, it, about once every year around September, it it does skyrocket. I don't know why. Um, and then it drops in November, and yeah, it it kind of it kind of drops in December as well. Uh, because everybody's pulling out of uh, hard money and buying things for their kids or something. That's my assumption, at least. But uh, I could be wrong. Uh, you, have you seen anything different, honestly? Are you into silver and gold a lot? Uh, no, me personally, no. But just based on that, I mean, I, I'm using logic at this rate. But based on those those figures, it would seem like if you're nearing the holidays, obviously, and it, you would pull out money before you buy presents and shit like that. Um, so you right. would see the rise, and then after you know holidays ended, you would see the fall again. Um, but just knowing human nature, people wait till the last minute all the time. You'd think there'd be a much greater rise towards the end of the year versus in September. So that's kind of interesting. To, interesting here. So yeah. Anyway, I basically, I just want to spend like the last um, fifteen minutes of the show talking about. Um, the non-aggression principle, and what that what that means to you know human beings and and uh, anarchists and uh, non-anarchists alike, and how you can apply that uh, in your day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day life, uh, and how certain things that you do are a contradiction of that, you know. And and like I said before, I don't accept the non-aggression as uh, this might confuse a lot of people, and I'm I'm sorry you're not up to speed on my nihilism, bro, but. Uh, I don't accept it as some objective moral, moral, you know, rule that everyone is bound by, um, because I do believe that morality is subjective; that it changes from person to person, it changes from culture to culture. In fact, I don't even believe that. You can't deny that it changes from person to person, and culture to culture, uh, and generation to generation, and all that. Um, what I believe is 
the no, I believe I accept the non-aggression principle and I and I advocate it in my day-to-day -day life because uh, like I said before because it, it you know um, I get an a negative feeling when I th if I think about initiating and act if I think about uh, acting aggressively towards someone or initiating force on someone it gives me a negative feeling inside to think about that because I'm empathetic towards other people uh, and I I you know I, I accept the golden rule I treat others how I I want to be treated I don't want to have aggression initiated against me therefore I don't initiate it against others I will defend myself from force. I will not initiate force, but um, you know, basically, most people seem to want to live their life that way. They they seem to want to, you know, not initiate force and violence and aggression on other people. Uh, but like I said at the beginning of the show, um, they don't seem to be able to put two and two together that um, government is is, you know, you can't support the NAP and support government at the same time. Because government is a violation of that. When I say government, I mean I mean the U.S. government or any involuntary government, where you can't get away from, you can't, you know, you have no say in what happens. You you are uh, you are subject to their rule, and if you don't like it, you can leave and you can go be subject to some other involuntary government rule. But basically. Um, you know, government is is a violation of the non-aggression principle because government uh, enforces. You know, governments have pol laws and policies. Laws and policies are um, they are they are um, enforced by law enforcers. Hence the name law enforcement, uh, which is a direct threat of force against you should you um, not comply to these laws or policies. So to vote for government. To support government is to support uh, threats or acts in uh, either indirect or direct acts of aggression on sovereign individuals who don't wish to comply uh, to these policies. Say people who do drugs, uh, prostitutes, people who commit uh, tax evasion, um, people who commit you know basically any any crime that doesn't directly produce a victim uh, a victim of harm or aggression. Uh, Enforcing any law that that basically criminalizes um, victimless activities is to support aggression on peaceful and sovereign, otherwise peaceful and sovereign individuals. So yeah, that's just basically what I, what I want to talk about. I'd like to mention uh, too. There, you, before you mentioned, there's a lot of muddying in the water, and and I remember seeing. Um, I think something through one of the anarchy groups we all frequent. It was um, about the nap being. Oh no, it was. It was one. I think it was there, but it was also somewhere on on a cop block about the non-aggression principle being uh, largely more pacifist than defensive, uh, focused on defensive action. Um, the nap has nothing to do with pacifist action. If somebody aggresses towards you, you have by all means, the right to defend yourself. And, 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 uh, wait, wait, wait. Cop, cop block said it was uh, pacifist? They, pacifist? No, not pacifist. But they weren't. They, it was more pacifist than it should be. If, if anybody aggresses against you, you have the right to defend yourself. If you can't oh, okay. because you're being extorted or you know ambushed by a ton of cops, that's yeah. There's nothing you can do about it at that point. You can just defend yourself yeah. from yeah. violence. Yeah, but yeah, but but it seemed like uh, Cop Block was advocating for a more pacifist form of the nap, which seemed to be. I mean, all they do is film film cops for the most part. Anyway, they advocate the film of cops, which is good. Transparency is great, but if you can't, if you're not advocating for the defense of your being, you you won't survive long enough. Yeah, yeah but this is sort of revolution. Yeah. That's why I, I kind of I support cop lock and some things that they do, and basically yeah. because I believe that cop lock is a gateway. Cop lock is a gateway oh, yeah. to getting people from status to anarchist. But yeah, yeah. I don't support cop lock 100% in what it does. Uh, the same reason that I don't know if you read the article that Christopher Cantwell wrote about them. But, yeah, uh, no, I did. I did read that very yeah. heated and passionate article. Yeah, he, he, he nailed it. He nailed it, didn't he? Though, yeah. like he's, you know, and I think of this all the time. Whenever 
I still call a cop lock because I, I will support them and what they do till the day I die. Not 100%, but I will still support, like I said, the gateway, getting people in. Um, but they, they support accountability to law enforcement, meaning that they support government so long as it's accountable. And I disagree with that. And I think it's very strange that they support uh, accountability for government instead of advocating against government, considering that Pete Yer and uh, Adam Freeman, are the founders of Coplock, are both anarchists. So I think that's weird. I think that that's just kind of a lapse in judgment with who they let admin that page and who they let. I, I think they accidentally let some anarchists in, but I'm sorry to interrupt you, Kika. Go ahead with what you're no, right. no, Completely, completely fine. That actually addresses a lot of what I was going to say. It seems uh, like what you were just saying that they, I don't know about letting admins in that were more miniaturists. That's just speculation at this point. But it definitely seems like they, you know, support a more statist mindset. You know, they want accountability from cops, yet they aren't, they aren't willing to take the necessary steps to remain truly free and voluntary and all that jazz. So it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense for them to support something like the NAP um, or even anarchy when they don't support it completely. So that was always confusing to me. I'm just gonna chime in about something earlier. Um, I was we were talking or Thomas was talking about how uh, feeling uh, you know people feel this empathy uh, for doing the right thing or not aggressing against other people and um, the negative feeling but people, yeah then people go about uh, you know using the government to get what they want and you know initiating force without really recognizing it I think a lot of people actually do recognize it but they're putting it to the side like you're saying like uh, cognitive dis dissonance mm -hmm. and um, but people think about their feelings too much. They don't actually think. You know, they feel and they act upon it. They don't actually think it through. They don't, you know, um, I think people stick in one mindset like their whole life and that's it. And they don't really, you know, maybe at least play with new ideas. Um, you know, well, maybe people play with it, but they don't really think it through. You know, well, it's, um, a, it's a social construct to you know roam with the herd until it until it gets until it gets really bad, and then people split off in all sorts of different directions. And that's, that's I think why anarchy is um, being misconstrued as chaotic. Right. Yeah. They just go. Uh, they agree with it. They uh, they don't really think it through. They um, anarchy is really um, interpreted by the government itself and media and movies and you know anarchy the purge or whatever you know that that's it that's in that, that's the end all be all you know right, right. And, um, you know because it's a lack of rules no that's not what anarchy is you know it's right. just the government puts their guns down for 24 hours and see what happens that's that's not what anarchy is <laughs> you know, you respect other people. You know, it's a matter of respect. It's a matter of um, uh, loving yourself, therefore loving others. Th that's the way I see it. Well, and there's a, I, I found, and I've only been, uh, I guess you could say I've only been an anarchist for two, two maybe three or four months now. I was mostly a, a constitutionalist for the last year and a half. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, upon entering the a bunch of anarchist groups, I realize that there's a lot more critical thinking and logical debate going on than there is in in any other groups. Um, uh, liberal groups, democratic minicarist groups, it, it, there's, it does not compare because they're, they're using self-ownership as, as the, the title of all of their debates. And if freedom is the title of all of your debates, you're going to continually reinforce freedom. Well, True. I don't think there can be any other standard than using logic and critical thinking in in any of your arguments. So for Cop Lock to meander through the herd with their their statism as, as small as it may be is illogical. If they they want to be more free and to hold 
police accountable, they can do that. They don't need to have the shitty state, you know, watching over them all the time. Right. Or whatever state anyone who's involved in cop lock is, is under. <laughs> Thomas? Uh, your mic is off. Yeah, unmute. Uh, You're wrong. Let's go. So basically, um, so we probably have to wrap the show up. Um, so that's actually a really good note to end on, though, is the fact that Cop Lock, you know, a lot of Cop Lock supporters, I'm glad that they have, you know, over a million supporters now on Facebook. That means that, you know, over a million people are for, you know, holding law enforcement responsible. That's at least a start in my mind. You know, as, uh, you know, my inner idealist is saying that that's a good start. Uh, my inner pessimist just wants to shit talk it, but um, basically, um, yeah, you know, that's still, there's still, a lot of those people still rely on, they still believe in the state, they still rely on the state, and to them I have to say, the state has created these people that you, you know, are so afraid of now, and that you're so concerned about their activities, that, you know, the state has created this, I was telling someone today, who was who was talking? He he came and he would confided in me about how um, so much bad stuff is happening and the government's not doing anything about it and, and Obama is not doing any, anything about it. It's just disgusting and it's like you know I told him you own yourself. You have to you know you don't stop relying on the state and and this applies to anybody who is watching this show right now who still supports the state or government in any way. Stop relying on the government to keep you safe. Stop relying on the government to protect you and your property uh, and your children and to look buy out for you and your safety and your well-being. Yes, buy a gun. Protect yourself. Train your, you know, you know, hit the gym. Lift some weights. Buy, buy, I hate to go Donnie Darko on you right now, but lift some weights. Buy some guns. Protect yourself. Next time somebody tries to initiate violence on you, you blast them. You defend yourself. You right. stop, calling, stop calling the cops. Stop voting. Stop right. perpetuating the ownership of others because you're perpetuating the problem and you don't even realize it. I always do a shout-out like this on our shows where I, where I call somebody out on something. It's like, just stop. You're screwing us yeah. all over. You, know? you own yourself. You and you alone are responsible for your own life, your own behavior, and your own actions. Start acting like it, you know? Anarchism is not chaos and lawlessness. It's not anyone new to this I, this philosophy. It's not chaos. It's not lawlessness. It's taking responsibility for your own actions, taking responsibility for your own for you know for your own ownership of yourself, um, protecting yourself, protecting your own property, protect your family. Stop relying on other people to do so. You know that is freedom. You are a sovereign yes. individual. You own yourself. You were talking about how, um, pe uh, you know, like cop block, uh, you know, brings people to liberty. Uh, you, how I came to liberty, unfortunately, was through a politician, Ron Paul. Oh, yeah. You know, and then, one, you know, and then I got... I'm sorry? That's no, a go good ahead. One, he, he's advocating anarchism now. Oh, he is? You haven't oh, seen any of those videos? That's awesome. No? <laughs> yeah, and he, Ron Paul, since he left Congress for the second time, he's been interviewed, and he's explicitly said that anarchism is the best idea. Oh my God! He's basically awesome. in a roundabout. He's in a roundabout fashion. He said anyone who knows shit about anything is going to support anarchism. That's you know, awesome. if an old guy like Ron Paul falls into anarchism, you know it's available for everybody. That's you can't <laughs> yeah, bullshit. Exactly. I can't believe you guys didn't know about that. That's awesome. Guy, I believe in it. Yeah. I, I believe that there were uh, some people that believe that Tom Thomas Jefferson was actually a supporter of uh, anarchism as well, but that's besides the no, point. He was a slave owner. Or shit. Well, that's true. That's that true. Itself is a contradiction of anarchism. <laughs> but yeah, All no, right. Ron Paul definitely supports anarchism now. So yeah. what does that tell you? That's awesome. Well, you could exactly. kind of tell this whole time, right? <laughs> yeah, he, he always did. He just didn't want to say it because yeah. it was a contradiction of his job. And I get and I respect what he was trying to do. I just think it, I just think it was a it was a circle jerk way of going about it. He's not. He had to have known that he wasn't going to accomplish anything by that. Or maybe he was just laying low and fooling us all. You never know. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, too. Hey, Kika, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it was no definitely a pleasure. Uh, Good. Uh, thank you. So, uh, yeah, we'll uh, see you all later, and take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.